a gubernatorial debate, talk of criminal conduct on the part of both candidates for governor. We talk about it next on Capital View. Welcome to Capital View, the weekly program on state politics and government and how it might just affect you. Joining me this week on Capital Week is Dave Dahl, Capital House reporter for WTX Radio. Welcome, Dave. Bruce, thanks. And also Charlie Weaver, uh, director of the Public Affairs P Reporting Program at University of Illinois Springfield. Welcome, Charlie. Thank you, Bruce. As Great. I always say, it's fun to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, it's been a busy week in Illinois politics and politics nationwide for that matter. Uh, so let's jump right into it here with uh, the latest on the Quincy Veterans Home Saga. Uh, Attorney General Lisa Madigan this week announced that she has started a criminal investigation into how Governor Bruce Rauner has handled the Legionnaires outbreak at the Quincy Veterans Home that has been exposed and well reported on by WBEZ Radio in Chicago. Uh, there have been uh, responses by uh, Republicans saying this is all a uh, game of politics. Uh, who are we to believe? Uh, wh what are we to make of all this? Well, in, in my mind, yeah, it's political season, so these charges uh, are being leveled at the Rauner administration in part because of politics. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, the fact of the matter, as revealed by the intensive study that the reporters, Dave McKinney and Tony Arnold of WBEZ did, was that the Rauner administration did not act promptly. The Rauner administration, including people in the governor's office, were more concerned about how do we handle this so that it doesn't get out to the public mm -hmm. that we have in a sense taken our time when the first diagnosis came in instead of sounding alarm and said, look, we got a problem right away. Mm -hmm. They tried to figure out a way to keep it from the press. And one of the emails said, uh, have you heard anything from the press yet? Mm -hmm. And they weren't going to say anything until there were inquiries. So you could say in hindsight, they should have done it earlier. They mm -hmm. were maybe hoping that this was just one isolated case and it mm -hmm. didn't amount mm -hmm. to anything. But as it turns out, a number of veterans lost their lives because of Correct. this. The state is being sued by some of the survivors of those deceased veterans, and we're on the hook. Ultimately, we're going to be paying millions of dollars in damages to those families. Mm -hmm. Okay, but on um, you know the countervailing argument here is let's take them one piece at a time. Uh, Lisa Madigan has been famous almost uh, in Illinois for saying I can't bring criminal charges against anybody. When she first ran for office, I believe in 2002, that was one of her things. I'm going to start a public integrity unit or something in the in the in the attorney general's office to uh, take care of these scoundrels who are engaged in corruption uh, uh, in government. Uh, and that was 2002. She hasn't delivered on that to the point where the Chicago Tribune 2014 refused to inter, uh, issue any endorsement of the rate ba on, in that race based largely on the fact that she you know, was the overwhelming favorite one. And number two, that, that was what they were saying was that uh, she hasn't used, she made that promise and she hasn't really fulfilled it. So there's been all kinds of corruption and, and, and criminal conduct on the part of public officials in Illinois since, two, since Lisa Madigan took office. Why has she leaped and seized on this one? That's one question I have. The second question I have is neither... Uh, nobody, so far as I've been able to see, has said, what charge would you file for what Rauner did or not did? Uh, is there some sort of aggravated failure to issue press release charge here? Uh, I don't know. But the Attorney General, nobody has made clear, here's what we're going after, obstruction of justice, uh, negligent homicide. I don't, you know, nobody has, has made that clear. And the last part of this that I don't frankly understand is to this point in time, I'm not trying to defend the governor here. Uh, but still nobody has made, so in so far that I'm aware of, is uh, a, an ironclad case that because of the way the governor's office handled this outbreak of Legionnaire's disease, it has resulted in 70 illnesses, 14 deaths. That's a lot of misery, a lot of sad families. But nobody that I've, I'm not aware of any sort of experts that have said uh, uh, that uh, the governor has blood on his hands, so to speak, as opposed to this was a terrible thing that happened. Uh, it was almost unprecedented in its in its its in terms of its scope. Uh, the governor could say the CDC was brought in, so that's what's on my mind. Let's well, talk. Go ahead, Dave. The governor could have moved him to Holiday Inn after he knew that there was a problem, and he didn't do that. And is that a crime? On the other hand, people are losing their uh, 
livelihood over Flint, Michigan. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, the prosecutors up there are putting it to them. And maybe uh -huh. this is the same thing. How right. is Flint analogous? I mean, Flint is a matter of changing water supplies foolishly. And this is a matter of Legionnaire's disease breaking out in an old facility with, with, with poor plumbing. And granted, everybody I think is right here in that the governor's office handled this horribly in terms of, of, of notifying folks. Was that lack of notification, can we say with certainty that that lack of prompt notification resulted in any deaths? Can we say that authoritatively? Well, uh, the lack of notification, w well, maybe not of the public, but internally, where people who worked there didn't even know it was dangerous, and uh -huh. uh, uh, loved ones of the people living there didn't know it was dangerous. Could they have stopped it before it got to 14 deaths? Will there be more deaths? And if so, does that add up to a criminal charge? That's all for the prosecutors to figure out. And you know, uh, you mentioned the civil cases. You know, if you mm -hmm. all you need to do is get a lawyer to take the case, mm -hmm. and the criminal uh, burden of proof is uh, much higher. Is much higher. I mean, we have the uh, state's attorney in the relevant county here, that being Adams, saying, "I don't want any part of this. This is politically motivated. This is my county. This yeah, is." Yeah, but on the other hand, he's going to impanel the grand jury, right? which Lisa Madding does not have the power to do on her Correct. own. She had to request him to impanel a grand jury to investigate the circumstances around the deaths of these uh -huh. people and the Round administration reaction to the outbreak. Now the investigation, the grand jury may decide, hey, everything was kosher, no problem. Okay. Or the grand jury may decide that there was criminal negligence on behalf of some of the people in the administration of not notifying, as, as Dave said, the people who work within the facility okay. and the general public that we have a problem here. Okay. Well, that's nice to know. Why haven't we heard, or at least that I've heard, why ha I have not heard the Attorney General or anybody else who's saying, saying this is one possibility, that's a possibility. Here's what we're trying to explore. I, I mean, and perhaps I've just been ignorant, I haven't been paying enough attention here. What I'm seeing is a lot of political fire, it seems, without us. us uh, here is Here are the possible charges. Po uh, criminal negligence, whatever they happen to be. Yeah, I, think, I think they were mentioned in some of the press okay. releases. And as a matter of fact, Senator uh, Tom Cullerton from Villa Park, a Democrat who's been very much all over this yeah. case because he's a veteran right? himself. He yeah. served, what, three years in, uh, as an infantryman? Something like that. Yeah, okay. and so he's been pushing for mm -hmm. the Attorney General to look at this stuff. Okay, and there was also the law that uh, was signed into, the bill that was signed into law uh, this past session uh, requiring that folks be notified. It's no longer on the list of optional things to do. Uh, that's not enough, uh, that the, the, the legislature now has, has seen a hole and they, pa they passed that law. What does that say if they had to pass that law against, uh, in terms of, of a criminal statute? Well, I guess what it would say is that we are now requiring you to do this by law the fact that you didn't do it in the past may have been negligent on your part uh -huh. to the extent that you have criminal liability for it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, th those are the arguments that the lawyers will make. Yeah. Okay. So I think we have to wait and see what, what if anything, the grand jury does. Okay. But yeah, the attorney general in Illinois, unlike some attorneys general across the country, mm -hmm. does not have criminal prosecutorial authority except to the extent that he or she is invited in by a local state's attorney. Okay. And it happens pretty fr frequently on, on big murder trials, for example, right. where the attorney general will, at the request of a local state's attorney, particularly in a small downstate county, sure. will come in and offer expertise. Right. And at the appellate level, the attorney general's office handles appeals mm -hmm. of decisions from down below defending mm -hmm. what the, the guilty pleas in, in essence, that have mm -hmm. been entered at the trial court level. Okay. But attorneys general do not have the power to impanel a grand jury on their own. They have to get a local state's attorney to agree to do it for them. Okay. And are we sure this local state's attorney is going to agree to do it for them? Well, I, he said he would. Okay. All right. Then, th then fair enough. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't speak to him, so I can't okay. say if I did. And he also thought that it was probably politically motivated. And mm -hmm. he explained that there's a grand jury. Kind of think, well, maybe there's something here, and we need to actually get it into a court of law and explore it. Well, if this is all true, why aren't we having somebody like the U.S. attorney or somebody who, whose last name isn't Madigan, let's be candid about this, uh, issuing this kind of statement at this point in time? Uh, how does this affect the, 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 the governor's race here? I mean, it, is, it, it certainly has an appearance which on some, some folks could question about whether it's politically motivated. And it's on her way out the door. It's her way on, out the door. She has no political capital here uh, to, to, to expend because she's not running again. 
It I, looks, I, it I was going to say, I can't empty. answer why the U.S. attorney hasn't done anything on it. Mm -hmm. Presumably the U.S. attorney is involved in other stuff. Isn't this the same district where the Aaron Schock case is going on? <laughs> and the, which is another kettle of fish. Well, but I mean. Yeah, yeah uh, or, or, or where the Schock case is not going We're on. We're not going like on. It. Yeah. And, it, and if you recall, some years ago, the U.S. attorney, then U.S. attorney in Chicago, told Lisa Madigan to stop looking into uh, Rod Blagojevich's right. hiring practices mm -hmm. because he had something going on and he didn't want her to interfere with what he was doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you know, I, I guess what I'm, what I'm thinking here, uh, among other things, is that uh, if 14 people are dead unnecessarily, if 70 people were sickened unnecessarily because the governor's office screwed up, and there was, uh, that's a lot of dead folks again. That's a lot of misery. That's a lot, that's a lot of tragedy. And if there was criminal culpability, I mean, I, I'm wondering why Lisa Madigan is, seems to be the only person who's picking up on it as opposed to, to anybody else. And I, I just seem to, it well, seems I suppose the timing might have been because the most recent revelations about the direct involvement of the governor's office just came out in the latest batch of emails, something like 50,000 documents mm -hmm. that uh, McKinney and Arnold just sure. finished. And they've done a great through. job throughout this, yeah. And, and they just had their first stories earlier this week. Well, they had so their the first timing might, yeah. be, might be part yeah. of it. The, and this is a, a, the latest in a series of stories, which yeah. they began reporting, I think, uh, late, late last year. They've had, they have had yeah, other they've stories. they've been at it for a year. Yeah, they've been at it for almost a year. And, 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 and they originally it, thought this would be like a two-week story, and it just kept snowballing. Yeah, in part it kept snow, snowballing, I think, because of exactly the sorts of things that they've uncovered here most lately, which the governor and he has this proclivity uh, for secrecy to the point of, 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 of scratch your head, everything from release of his, of his appointment calendars to this. And you wonder, you know, uh, it, it, the, I think the most damning thing, obviously, at least for me, in the WBEZ report was that email from the Deputy Secre Press Secretary, now employed by Donald Trump. She's, a, she's asked, should we make an announcement? No, let's wait and see if any reporters ask. Yeah. That looks bad. It looks bad. I just wonder if that's criminal bad. I suppose in the, in the long run, it will depend on what a 12-person jury decides if it ever gets, if it gets to, that to that point. point. Yeah, and okay. it, that will depend on whether the grand jury decides, yes, there's enough here that we should go to court. Uh, on the flip side, let's go to toilets for a second. Uh, mm -hmm. We have the inspector general in Chicago saying, uh, uh, geez, uh, uh, Mr. Pritzker here, the candidate for governor, uh, has rooked the taxpayers uh, for, on the, for the tune of $330,000. He's defrauded folks uh, by tearing these toilets out of his mansion. And Pritzker, the candidate, now says, okay, well, I'll pay the money back. Uh, what do we, that seems, I think, at least for a lot of folks, frankly, including me, an easier allegation to understand that you tr you took a tax a, a tax break that you weren't entitled to, and therefore uh, the public was was out of money. Uh, how is it, did Pritzker make a mistake at all in saying I'll pay the money back, or she have dug his heels in? No, I would say that. Uh, he should have paid the money back before he started his campaign, <laughs> realizing <laughs> that maybe, maybe this is going to be an issue. Yeah. Uh, maybe I acted in good faith as I understood the rules. Maybe uh -huh. I didn't, but if I pay it back, then when it comes up later on, I can say, I realized that I goofed up and I paid it back. Mm -hmm. Mood issue now. Mm -hmm. Multi-billionaire. I guess that's how you get to be a multi-billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you take out the toilets to save 300 grand. <laughs> one urinal at a time. I mean, that would be like, uh, you know, one of us uh, dropping a dollar bill and wondering, boy, should I bend down and pick that up? Yeah, I would. <laughs> Probably would, too. But I'd fight you for it. <laughs> both, both, but yeah, one, one of the things that I think people don't understand is, because I saw Jeannie Ives had a comment that he was cheating the school children or something like that. Well, that's not true. His $330,000 over a five-year period, it averages out to about, what, $66,000 a year, okay. uh, was spread out among all the other taxpayers, property taxpayers sure. that year. Mm -hmm. So the schools and all the other local governments got whatever they asked for, except for those that were maybe subject to the tax cap limitation. Mm -hmm. But whatever they levied, that's what they got. Yeah. And the difference is that that $66,000 a year was divided, instead of it coming from Prisker, divided among all the others, the millions, I don't know the exact number, but I guess it's, it's quite a few taxpayers in Cook sure. County. The, the taxes that were The extended, loss per taxpayer is negligible, if, the, if this is true. 
Well, it's the principle of the thing, yeah. and it's offensive. You maybe only had to pay ten dollars more. I didn't. I haven't done the math, yeah. but on a base, uh, an annual base of roughly fourteen billion, sixty-six thousand is mm -hmm. pretty small change. Yeah. So but as I say, it's, it's the easy. principle of the thing. It's easy to understand. Yeah. And the yeah. people who are the victims are those who didn't have the foresight to rip the toilets out of their homes, out yeah. of their second homes. Or, or the people who I have to pay whatever is five dollars more than I would have because J.B. Pritzker got a break he didn't deserve. Yeah. yeah, and then the Pritzker argument is, and there was actually a, a statement from the assessor's office, the Cook County assessor's office, that it wasn't just the toilets. The place was uninhabitable because it had been gutted. It was mm -hmm. being renovated, mm -hmm. and the renovation halted because of some contract dispute, and that's mm -hmm. when the reassessment came. Yeah. Well, both the toilets and the veterans' home came up uh, in last night's gubernatorial debate, uh, which uh, I've, I hope we've all watched. I, I, I certainly have. Who won? Who, who do we think won the debate? Dave? Cash Jackson. <laughs> we have one on cash. <laughs> the libertarian candidate who was otherwise occupied last night. Well, he, well, he was otherwise not invited. Otherwise now, not I invited. Thought, I thought Cash won the first one. If you didn't know uh, anything about Illinois, if you'd landed from Mars uh. at 5.59 p.m. the night of the debate and saw that four-way fracas between Rauner and Pritzker and Jackson and Sam McCann, mm -hmm. you know, uh, maybe you do like the way the libertarian sounds. Mm -hmm. But in terms of who won, well, I think it's hard to say. I think if you like one guy, your guy won. Mm -hmm. If you yeah. like the other guy, the other guy won. Yeah. No new ground was broken. Yeah. What do you think, Charlie? And I would add, if you were looking for some insight into public policy from either of these guys, <laughs> you, you lost. You lost. On the other hand, if you're looking some kind of a, uh, a version of a verbal cage match, no holds barred, <laughs> you probably enjoyed it. Well, you it's know. Better than World Wrestling Federation. <laughs> Well, I don't think it was cage match enough, frankly, for me. I mean, in, in, in this sense. Look, these guys weren't going to stand up and enlighten us with anything the, the close oh, to, to, that, to that an intelligent review. Yeah, they anymore. never do. They never do. And so... But I can dream, right? <laughs> you're entitled to your dreams with yes. this after all America. Sam has um, left to yell at his TV. Get used to it, brother! Get used to it, brother! <laughs> well, what I thought about, I thought that Pritzker could have been much harder on Rauner. Uh, and I guess the basis for my belief on that is they barely mentioned the budget impasse uh, during the whole uh, debate. It, not once, and if I was Pritzker, and, and you know, there's good reasons why I'm not, but if I was J.B. Pritzker, I would have been saying again and again, $1 billion, that's how much we had to pay in interest because of this two-year budget impasse, and then clicking down the list of what $1 billion would have paid for, and say it, it, again and again, it's your fault because we ended up right back where we, we got nothing for that other than paying out a $1 billion in interest and a whole bunch of human misery. And what would his answer have been? And the 14 veterans, he hasn't well, hit that as hard as he certainly could have. Well, I thought it, yeah, it's cool. all wrapped up in this notion that you're a failure. You're a failure. Right, you're a failure. And yeah. he doesn't want to go down the laundry list, I guess. He just wants to reinforce the simple notion, you're a failure. You're a failure. Yeah, well, he does. But, he, and, and, you know, but there were times, I thought, frankly, mm. that Rauner was able to actually make himself you know, uh, uh, look not bad. Well, he was, he was angrier. He was angry. He was. He he did take the, and he has to. I think at this point, he's what twenty some points down in the polls. I mean, he's he's got to pull out all the stops, you know. But but uh, Rauner, for example, on the issue of immigration, uh, uh, they were asked about sanctuary uh, 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 town, cities, states. Uh, the Trust Act came out that that, that Rauner had had signed uh, last year, which upset you know conservatives in Illinois. And you had uh, J.B. Pritzker praising him. Yeah, signing the Trust Act was was a, a good thing to do. And if he'd been you know overly a political animal, he would have said signing the Trust Act was a good thing to do, but still there was a billion dollars in interest you didn't pay and think of, you know, he didn't, he let him off on that point. I thought the governor looked not bad when it came to the education funding question. He looked like he was in fairly, you know, a lot of this is going to be uh, image and whatnot. And yeah, he, he looked and sounded in command. Whether he was or not, he looked well, and sounded and in Pritzker command. Well, and could have pointed out more forcefully that the reason that we reformed education was uh, not through the good efforts of Bruce Rauner, sure. but rather through the efforts of Andy Menard, principally, and other lawmakers who worked on it for several years, yeah. and ultimately were able to get enough Republicans and Democrats to agree this is something we need to do, mm -hmm. so that they were able to uh, 
put the governor after he vetoed the first one around, right, said right. it was a Chicago bailout, which was not totally true. Correct. Uh, he winds up being put in a position where he has no choice to sign the second one, which was actually more favorable to Chicago mm -hmm. than the one that he vetoed. Yeah. So it wasn't that he was in the spearhead of all this stuff, no. as he suggested. It's this is yeah. something he had no choice. Sure, I mean he, he tried he, to he make the, the best out of from his position a bad. A, a bad deal. Yeah. The one thing he got into it was this uh, money made available to parents of private school children mm -hmm. for scholarships, mm -hmm. assuming that there would be enough donors to kick into the pot in order to get an income tax credit. Right. You know, it, 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 I think your point about Senator Menar is a good one. I mean, you, you had folks like Menar and other legislators, but Menar primarily was known for this, you know, working in the trenches for years, thankless mm -hmm. work, you know, slogging through this and dealing with all sorts of, of, of interest to grind out, you know, something close to it, to a final package. And, and then here comes Rauner swooping in, claiming the victory. And, and, and you know, if, if, if Menar is upset, I don't think you, you could blame him. But yeah, that point wasn't brought up. And the governor came across as I fixed education funding in Illinois and there's a lot of folks who would beg to differ with that um, so uh, other things that perhaps we should be thinking about uh, quickly I guess is uh, there was a cartoon that was published online uh, that had Illinois Times on it uh, a couple days ago uh, and that's the paper I, I work for uh, without going through uh, uh, the details of this uh, it was never published in our newspaper it was never on our website however we got the credit slash blame it showed a uh, 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 Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh's daughter depicted her saying her nighttime prayer and saying the second prayer and it was a, it was uh, uh, rooted in the nominee's testimony about his daughter's prayer uh, for the uh, uh, dr. Ford uh, um, and this was she was brought up by the nominee herself uh, if you've seen the cartoon a lot of folks have uh, it was widely chastised it was ri widely uh, uh, condemned as you don't bring the children of political figures into the public debate. That's a line that you don't cross. And so there was a feeling that we had crossed that line. Uh, lots of angry calls. Uh, uh, and so uh, I'm not sure whether you folks have seen it or not, but uh, how far can we go these days? Is it ever OK to bring up uh, a spouse or, 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 or a child? Or I mean, we know Nixon, R Richard Nixon made it OK to bring up Cocker Spaniels, but how much further can we go? Well. The defense, if I could use the word defense, sure. is that the nominee himself brought it up. And uh -huh. that the cartoon was a spin on what he said during the confirmation. Correct. Thus, it is fair. Yeah. On the other hand, a lot of people don't, don't feel that way. Mm -hmm. And that uh, the wife and kids, et cetera, uh, mm -hmm. it shouldn't be fair game. Mm -hmm. But, you know, how many of us made fun of Kitty Dukakis and uh, her addiction problems? Yep. And uh, we've talked about, when you look at uh, Estes Kefauver uh, having uh, seen a mental health uh, you know, a psychiatrist uh, mm -hmm. back then. Mm -hmm. uh, that was certainly not the place where you would go today, certainly not, uh, to, yeah. to pick on somebody like that. Yeah. And they wrote bad reviews about Margaret Truman singing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and uh, even further back than then, somebody once brought up Andrew Jackson's wife and nearly paid for it with his life on the dueling field. Uh, so, I, you know, it's been a strange week. And That'd be a debate. <laughs> you see that. <laughs> well, thankfully, one that we, we, we don't have to have because it never ultimately happened. But, you know, I guess what I found having you know, fielded a couple of calls, you know, and, and, and talking to folks who were really mad about this. I mean, just extremely mad. Uh, it, they were long conversations. And, and what I was impressed with, and it's by no means anything other than an anecdote, but these were folks that felt differently about the issues maybe th th than I did. But what I found out, what I discovered, or what I think I discovered, is there were several points of commonality that we were able to just talk about. And even when folks come in hot and they're screaming, spitting mad, if you sit and you talk and you listen to each other, actually, you find out you, at the end of a few minutes, you say thanks for talking and, and you say goodbye. It doesn't always have to be bad or angry. And so uh, that's just a point of observation, I guess, because the cartoon did get such wide play. Yeah, Eric Zorn in the Tribune had a thing uh, comparing the drunk girlfriend uh, part of it to uh, uh, you know something that was played for laughs in the movie Sixteen Candles which came out around the time of this uh, Kavanaugh, uh, Blasey Ford alleged uh, mm -hmm. encounter, the early 80s. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, there was, you know, I guess we've shifted gears a bit to the national scene, but times have 
changed uh, dramatically, I think. Uh, there was a photograph on the Yale Daily News in 1985 that ran of the fraternity that the uh, nominee was a member of, and they had a flag made of women's undergarments that they were have to fly. And this was published in the campus newspaper uh, with no attempt to hide in quotes, and everybody, nobody seemed to object to it at all. There was, you know, to her great credit, somebody a, two, a few days later did write a letter back in 1985 saying, this is a little misogynistic. I'm not sure this is the right thing. She was uh, a wise woman woman, I think. So uh, lastly, let's uh, talk very quickly. We're almost out of time. A uh, story came out this week uh, by our colleague Mike, uh, Mark Maxwell, WCI-TV, about uh, Sam McCann, gubernatorial candidate, and Sam McCann's ties to Chicagoland money, Chicagoland political operatives. Uh, is this a surprise to anybody? I mean, that the, 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 uh, the station was able to say, hey, uh, you're on the ballot thanks to some money from Chicago, thanks to some help gathering petitions from folks in Chicago apparently didn't even know your name. Are we, su are we surprised? Should we be? I would say that the element that brought the union money to Sam McCann mm -hmm. was the fact, as the union leader said, we have some conservative members who are Republicans, we have some more liberal members who are Democrats, and our conservative people didn't like either of the two major party candidates. Mm -hmm. And they saw in Sam McCann someone who reflects their values. Okay. And you know the governor likes to portray McCann as being a tool of Mike Madigan, mm -hmm. and I don't think that's quite fair any more than it was fair to say that uh, Jeannie Ives was Mike Madigan's favorite lawmaker. <laughs> and, and the reason that Ives ran and the, the, the issues that McCann picked mm -hmm. up on were what we already talked about. For example, mm -hmm. the Trust Act, yeah. which he voted against, Ives voted against, Madigan voted for it, and Rauner signed it. Yep. Same thing with the bill expanding abortion coverage yeah. under the Medicaid program yeah. and the health insurance, state health <laughs> insurance. <laughs> so it's, it, I don't see McCann as being uh, a Madigan plant. Okay. People who are helping Madigan also are helping him. Yeah because I think of their leadership. Okay. And with that, we're out of time. And so thanks for joining us this week. And thank you for watching us. We'll see you next week on Capital Via.